Yeah, I, g I gave the title of EMF, Electromagnetic Fields and Biology and Health. Uh, perhaps the title should be Electromagnetic Radiation, but radiation doesn't really occur physically until you have higher frequency. Because I'm going to extend it down to the lower levels, the power frequency also, because apparently the body doesn't discriminate. The divisions in the spectrum were made by man. The uh, physics was made some other way. And uh, the way we divide it is uh, uh, sometimes misleading. But let me show you what the electromagnetic spectrum looks like. It's depicted here vertically as a whole series of frequency ranges, starting at the very bottom in the power frequency, where you see a tower that carries the power lines. And it goes all the way up to cosmic rays. And the frequency range is enormous. And that dividing line in between that red line across about two-thirds of the way up is a line that separates what's called ionizing radiation from non-ionizing radiation. And physicists find this a very important demarcation because ionizing radiation is very powerful. The thing is that as you go up this spectrum, you get more and more energy. And when you reach that red line, you, reach, you get enough energy for the radiation to knock electrons out of atoms. And that's why it's ionizing. It, it forms ions. And so physicists have been reluctant to think about very much biology because they say, you can't cause any chemical change until you knock electrons out. But you're going to see that there's a lot of evidence showing that you can cause a lot of chemical change because we're not sitting in still electrons. We're not little chemical jars or bottles with compounds in them. We're a dynamic system. We're all set in lots of ways to, to, to move, to do things. Our nerves are not sitting at zero base. They're already very close to firing. They have to be because they have to be sensitive to minor changes that occur in the environment. So while the physicists may be right that you need a certain amount of energy to knock electrons out to cause a chemical change, biology doesn't work that way. Biology has a lot of prime systems that are all set to go very close to the tipping point. And often, the tipping point is very, very close to what's around us in the environment. So uh, I show you on the, uh, you see the side at the bottom, there's a group of frequencies that are enclosed by this yellow line. These are frequencies that were virtually absent 150 years ago, virtually absent from our environment. We have put them there with our technology. The electric light bulb came in, and we started putting in power lines. And then we put in radio, we put in television, we put in Wi-Fi, we put in microwave ovens. It, it, we've been creeping up that spectrum. And of course, as you creep up, you get more and more energy. And that energy is doing things. And I'm going to show you some of the things it does. And the interesting thing is that it does these things at very, very low energies. As I said, the biological systems are sitting primed, ready to move when they have to move. And so uh, be, keep it in mind that a lot of the stuff that's there is stuff that has come in. It's man-made. I should say person aid. That's uh, to, to be appropriate. Let's say, say according to our current time. Although Edison probably would not have, would have said man-made. But anyway, uh, we change with the times, and unfortunately, some of the changes we don't realize that change is occurring so quickly. I show you a picture of power lines. This is a picture that was taken with a fluorescent bulb suspended in the power in the field there. I say field. You don't know that there's a field. You don't feel it. You don't see it. But the fluorescent bulb tells you that there's a difference between the voltage at the two ends of that fluorescent bulb. And that voltage is enough to cause that bulb to light up. So this is what you, we're dealing with when you're dealing with electric fields and magnetic fields. We don't feel them because our sensors are not equipped to respond to these things. The fluorescent bulb can respond to it. We built it that way to respond to it. But these fields are large and they have effects. This is an effect on a bulb, but there are effects that occur on us as well. Now, people have recognized that there are important effects, and we've set up safety standards. And the agencies that deal with this uh, for uh, presumably to protect us and to ensure our safety have already 
made decisions about some of the stuff that's in our environment. The ELF, which is the extremely low frequency that deals with power line kinds of voltages, uh, they say it's a possible carcinogen. This was one of the earliest things that was established because there were a lot of data to show that children living w w very close to the power lines were coming down with uh, leukemia. And the, the rate at which they, the risk of leukemia was doubled when the, power, when the magnetic field reached a certain level of about four milligauss. Now, we don't, you don't know what a milligauss is unless you've made some measurements with, a, with an instrument, but in this room, we have something that's approaching probably one milligauss. I don't know, has, uh, Kevin, it's about one milligauss. So we're not very much above that when you get a steady exposure to something like four milligauss, it doesn't take long to develop leukemia. And leukemia is one of the cancers that develops rather quickly because it peaks at three to four years exposure. So children living in this environment get this kind of cancer, and this was the decided back in 2002, they decided that that was the case. Now, with radio frequency, the same agency, the WHO, decided that that was also a possible carcinogen. So this is creeping up that scale, that spectrum, that as the, age, as the frequency gets higher, and as there's more energy in there, they say that's also a possible carcinogen because there are enough studies now to show that there are cancers that occur, <coughs> cancer of the brain that you get when you hold a cell phone close to your head. And I'll go through some of the data, I'll show you some of the uh, results that have been published, but there's sufficient evidence for them to make that assertion. So now we have a pretty long, a good section of the uh, spectrum that has been told to us from the WHO, which by the way is a very conservative organization, they try not to jump into anything. They're very, they've got all kinds of political controls, and I shouldn't say controls, but political influences on them that keep them from going out and saying things pretty directly. But they have actually said that this is a possible carcinogen. Many on the committee who made that decision have publicly said that it should have been a probable carcinogen because there's now sufficient evidence for many, according to many experts, that they could say that. Now, the standards that have been set by the safety agencies, including uh, uh, Canada, uh, co Safety Code 6, and that was recently revised, and I was uh, involved in that uh, work, or at least the assessment as well, they kept the old standards. And it's kind of amazing in the, in the face of all the uh, data that have recently been accumulated that they were able to stick with that. And I guess they, the Royal Society has gone along with it and accepted the report, and I guess that's going to be the law of the land. But it makes no sense, as you'll see, from some of the data that have been accumulated. So they say that in order to protect the population, the only way in which you can assess damage is if the tissue heats up. So if you get a, that's called a thermal response and a thermal criterion. Well, we know when things heat up, you can get damage. We, we know that, and you burn yourself, and things get pretty hot. But the thing is, molecularly, the damage occurs much, much earlier. Before there's damage due to thermal uh, change, you can get a lot of molecular damage, and we've actually measured that. So the, uh, it is, their criterion is wrong from the start, and as a result, they overlook the necessary conditions that they must set to ensure that the population is safe. And, that what the, and the look at the bottom line of that slide, it says biological standards are needed. We're not talking about heating up a pot, you know, of water in there. We're talking about things, that, reactions that are occurring in living cells, and these have to be taken into consideration. Now, the U.S. Department of the Interior recently got into this uh, story, and here's a quote there, and I've got some of it outlined in red, as you can see. Well, let me read the whole thing. The electromagnetic radiation standards used by the Federal Communications Commission continue to be based on thermal heating, a criterion now 30 years out of date and inapplicable today. That was just released in March. And this is one agency finally getting out and saying that these guys, they got their heads stuck somewhere and it's not in a place where they're getting sufficient oxygen. So, <laughs>
the thermal criterion is really not a very, it's not a useful one because we need something that's biological. And there is a biological response. And this is one of the, this is the work that we were doing at Columbia University because we found that when cells are in trouble, they have a specific set of reactions. Uh, this is called the cellular stress response. It was first identified in connection with uh, an increase in temperature, oddly enough. It was uh, an Italian biochemist, or actually biologist, who uh, was studying uh, uh, salivary glands in uh, Drosophila, and he found that when they were exposed to, to higher temperature, their glands swole, st started to swell, and uh, you got this puffing, as they called it, and this was realized, it was called the heat response, and it was referred to as heat shock. Well, the work we did at Columbia showed that this heat shock was, occur was stimulated by electromagnetic fields as well. We showed it with the power frequency, and we showed it with radio frequency. We showed it with cell phones uh, causing this same uh, reaction. And the reaction has a telltale chemical uh, indicator. These are stress proteins. And when you measure the stress protein, the cell is telling you it's in trouble. These stress proteins are designed by the cell to help uh, correct the damage, help move molecules to places that, where they should be. It's a whole, and we don't know all the functions yet because there are about 20 of these stress proteins and it's still being worked on. But there can be no doubt that this is a biological indication of the damage and it should be used as an indication of the damage. And they can forget about the thermal criterion because the, this indication of the damage occurs when there is damage. And you're not relying on some learned scientists, you're relying on what the cell is telling you. And the cell makes no mistakes because it knows when it's in trouble. And I think that this is the important thing that, the, uh, that has come from this research. And the interesting thing, that last point on that slide, the stimuli cause the DNA to start the synthesis of stress proteins. Because what this means, in order for a cell to make proteins, it has to take the DNA, which is a double helix, and has to pull the two chains apart so it can read the code. The code is in between the two chains. They're the bases that connect the two chains. So the DNA has to come apart. So when you see a stress protein, you know that the cell had, has been stimulated to the point where the DNA has come apart. So it's really an indication that you're getting an interaction with the DNA. And it's no surprise that this kind of radiation is causing a reaction with the DNA. Now this cellular stress response, and I'll give a couple of references. This is a review paper that uh, was written by Reba Goodman and myself. We've worked together for many years at Columbia University. And uh, we were the ones who found this uh, stress protein with EMF. And we also uh, were able to show that this occurs long before there's a change in temperature. So the thermal criterion, which is used by in defining safety code six here in Canada or anywhere else, it's really, it makes no sense biologically. It, make, it may make these guys feel okay because they're largely non-biologists who are sitting around making the decisions. But, and they're scientists, they say, but they don't, they don't call in biological expertise. They've got their own idea. They think that this has not been established. I don't know how much more information they need to call it established. It's as well established as most other scientific ideas today. And one other thing that we have done in connection with this uh, stress response is that we have identified the segment in the DNA that actually reacts with the EMF. In other words, to cause this DNA to come apart, there must be an interaction with the DNA itself. We found in the case of one particular stress protein, it's called HSP70, we, we were able to get the part of the promoter, that's the first part of the DNA that carries the information about the, uh, the structure of the protein, we were able to get that first part of the promoter and take it out of the molecule and attach it to another code, in other words, we, to code for another protein. And then when we stimulated that, we were able to get this other protein to, synthesize, to be synthesized. So in other words, we were able to use, to hijack the code that's in the cell and use it for our own purposes, proving in effect that this is what goes on during the normal stress protein synthesis. Now, 
Uh, going back down on the spectrum, and I've just been all over the, uh, the non-ionizing, because we did it both for power frequency and for uh, uh, radio frequency. Uh, we, this is a summary of work that's been done in connection with the power frequency. I already mentioned the leukemia, which occurs at very rel relatively very low levels. Uh, you see at three to four milligauss in the top line there, uh, that's the level at which you get a doubling of leukemia. But if you look at the line just below that, you get a, uh, an odds ratio that increases to four. In other words, the odds ratio doubles, meaning that it's twice as likely to get it uh, when uh, and it occurs at 1.8 milligauss when there are mutations in DNA repair genes. In other words, there are certain cases where, you, where people have damage to the DNA repair genes and they are far more vulnerable to leukemia when this occurs. So this is another piece of evidence indicating that this uh, evidence links in with the DNA itself. And when you get damage to DNA, it could be repaired, but sometimes the repair doesn't occur because of the damage, and then you increase the risk of, of, the, uh, of, of getting this uh, leukemia. Uh, the, other, the second point in there is about Alzheimer's. So not only are children affected, but there's evidence for Alzheimer's. This was a study that was done throughout uh, Switzerland where you've got a, an increase in Alzheimer's disease for people who live within 50 meters of these power lines. That's a, an interesting point because not only do you get this increase in Alzheimer's disease, but they have what's known as a dose response. People who live for five years don't get it quite as much as people who live for 10 years and those who live for 15 years. In other words, you get a, a gradation of incidence of Alzheimer's and the longer you're exposed to uh, life uh, in this vicinity. And then there's also evidence for breast cancer. Now, we are talking earlier about the uh, influence on pregnant women. Uh, Dr. Uh, Deacon Lee from uh, the Kaiser Permanente down in California did a study many years ago about the uh, effect of uh, these heated uh, electric blankets on pregnancy, and actually it was on miscarriage, and he found that there was an increase in miscarriage at some relatively high exposure. All you needed was one. If you hit that level, then there was a miscarriage during the first trimester. Uh, and he published that. It was a group, by the way, and the, but he followed the children who were born from this particular cohort, and now that the children are in the order of about 10, 12 years old, he has done a study on them, and lo and behold, he has found an increase in asthma and an increase in obesity in the children who were exposed to a, a relatively low level of uh, EMF during their pregnancy. So it's almost as if you're, you're exposed, when you're exposed in utero, it has profound effects that only manifest themselves later on. It may be that this is the, uh, the part of the reason that we have the increase in uh, asthma now, a lot of asthma that I remember when I went to school, I don't recall any children having asthma in, in our classes. And now it's quite common. Children go around with these special inhalers. And the same thing with obesity. I remember years ago, there was, uh, obesity was, was rare. I, I went to school in England, and I remember you could always tell an American on the streets there. <laughs> wanky, you know, sort of Gary Cooper type. And now, I mean, we fill the streets, you know, it's literally, and the thing is that it's a, uh, obesity is an epidemic, and I think it's true here in Canada as well. And who knows whether that's related or not, but it certainly makes you think. Now here's a study that was done in, in San Francisco at the Sutro Tower, which is a transmitter of a whole bunch of different frequencies. It's the radio TV. And to give you an idea, that's the tower. And right at below, those little white specks down there, those are houses. And so you get an idea of how tall this is and the range. It's supposed to give coverage to all of San Francisco. Well, a good part of San Francisco. And this is the incidence of uh, cancer in children as 
you uh, as a plotted as a function of the distance from the tower where it's transmitting, and you see what happens as you as the tower uh, as you're closer to the tower, the greater the incidence. It's no big surprise, but it tells you that it's probably related to the the radiation that's coming from that tower. But if you take a look at one value down there at three kilometers, it's sort of halfway down that curve. You look at the level, what the what the risk is. He measured, this was a study done by Dr. Neil Cherry from uh, uh, New Zealand, who died a number of years ago, but he did a lot of good work. And at three kilometers, you can, he measured the power density, which was one microwatt per centimeter squared. That is a thousand times lower than the current safety standard. Tells you something, that the standards that are set today really bear no resemblance to what we see in reality. In other words, the real risk that occurs in the world is really very much higher if we're to believe these data. And he went over data, uh, I don't have the years down, oh yes, 37 to 88, which means that he covered a lot, a lot of years of, of these uh, childhood cancers. And this study was recently, uh, not repeated, but a similar study was done in Brazil. And there you see a similar curve but this is having to do with cell phones and cell phone antennas. And if you look at the, uh, the, the second set of uh, this, the base stations between 2003 and 2008, you see an increase in the field strength and in the power density. It goes from three to 40. In other words, over tenfold increase in the power that has gone, that is uh, being delivered to people there. And that's why these are the data that you see. The, cur the graph shows that there's an increase that is uh, having to do with how close you are to these antennas. Now, there are also studies that have been done on cell phone use and the incidence of, of cancer. Uh, if you look at the bottom line on that, it has to do with the, the two points I want to make about that. One is that cordless phones, which were initially believed, not believed, but were said to be different from cell phones, uh, they are uh, just as bad. And the second point in there is that the risk ratio, RR, the risk ratio increases if you start as a teenager. So children are particularly vulnerable to a lot of these changes. This is an interesting study that was done on parotid gland uh, cancer. Parotid gland is in the jaw, uh, it's a salivary gland, and uh, people, when you put up a cell phone to your cheek, uh, you're irradiating the salivary gland. But you're irradiating not only the parotid gland, you're also irradiating the submaxillary gland. And uh, another, uh, is a, there are other glands in there. And what they've done in this study is compared the cancers that result in both of these glands, and you see the one that's above the mandible, above the jawbone, gives you an increase because it's not protected. But the one below the jawbone is pretty flat and has not gone up. Tells you something. These are the kinds of data that people have been collecting, and they're pretty indicative of the f connection between the pathology and the exposure to these, this kind of radiation. Now, I want to bring this back to where we started with the, with the DNA, because I think the DNA is really the link pin, the linchpin here, that relates all this to the biology. And it's the biology that is telling. The biology tells you that you've got this kind of uh, DNA that's wrapped up in every cell. Every nucleus in a cell has all this DNA. And one of the things about the DNA is it's pretty long. It's six feet long, right. can't reach that far. Yet, it packs itself into a nucleus, which is really very tiny. It's the order of a micron, maybe even less. And how does it do it? Well, it coils itself up, and it keeps on coiling. So you get a coil, and then you get another coil, a coiled coil, this kind of uh, structure. So it gets compacted, and it sits in the nucleus. And obviously, it's not sitting there quietly. It's doing all this stuff and interacting with the environment. Uh, I remember when I went to school, I was told, I was taught that the DNA is just the stuff that does the, uh, you know, the, it, it's there for reproduction. In other words, it carries the genetic information and it kind of sits there and waiting until it's, 
person is mature and then it's transmitted to the next generation. That's not the way it works. The DNA is working all the time. The DNA has the code for all the proteins that we need and it's coming apart and coming together and so on. It's very active and it's doing the stuff that has to be done to keep the cell alive. Well, the thing about the DNA being in this coiled coil structure is that it acts like a special kind of antenna. The DNA has a, oh, I don't have that. The DNA has in this uh, structure here, which represents the bases between the two strands of the, uh, the two uh, DNA chains, that actually has a bunch of electrons in it. And these are the electrons that interact with the field. The field can interact with the electrons in there and cause them to move. And it's more like an antenna. The interesting thing about the antenna is, if you remember, I don't know how many of you remember the old antennas that people used to have on, the, uh, on their TV set. And you see, there used to be a couple of bars on there of different lengths. And the reason they had different lengths was that each length was tuned to a particular wavelength or a particular frequency, if you want to think of it that way. And that's why you can get the higher frequencies or the lower frequencies and get them all. Well, this coiled coil structure in the DNA acts like this kind of an antenna, a fractal antenna, and it, it interacts with a whole variety of frequencies. And I think that's the reason why the DNA is so vulnerable to all this radiation that's around. It has little pieces in it that can react with all the different frequencies that are around, and it does react with all these frequencies. So it is, it makes sense, and the structure does relate to the way we see it functioning. Now, one of the things, well, let me go on to the, the next slide. There was a great study that was done in Iceland where the, uh, they have a very homogeneous population. Uh, it was settled many years ago by, I believe, people from Norway or from Denmark, but it was a pretty homogeneous population. And one of the interesting things about a homogeneous population is that their DNA is pretty homogeneous. And so if there's any exotic thing in there, like you get a funny disease, that DNA, you, you can pick out the gene very easily or relatively easily. And they've been doing a lot of that. So they've been, they really have a great genetics uh, capability. And they did that study in uh, Iceland. And here is a plot of the number of mutations they find as a function of the age of the father. The, you see that as the father gets older, the, there are more mutations that they find in the DNA. This is the DNA in the sperm. And it's not true of the mother. And the reason is that all little girls are born with all their eggs. And the eggs mature when they reach puberty and they're released roughly once a month. But it's the eggs that are in there all the time. Males have sperm that is made again at puberty, but it's made by spermatocytes. Spermatocytes, the primary spermatocytes, are, are born with you and they stay with you. And these are the sources of the sperm cells. And when you get damage to that, that damage stays in these primary spermatocytes. The eggs in the girl are a very small target. The spermatocytes are targets like everything else. And that's why you've got this uh, same kind of system which shows that the, the uh, frequency of mutations is uh, greater the older the father. And it doesn't correlate at all with the mother. And the other interesting thing about this is that you see different colored dots on there. And they show that the increase in autism Go, increases with the age of the father and with the uh, number of mutations in the, the, in the father's uh, DNA. So it's a pretty strong indication that we are getting genetic damage as a result of living. And the thing is that uh, sometimes it's, uh, it, it results in, in disease and it's pretty bad. But anyway, it's a very interesting result and it can only have been done I guess today in a place like Iceland. Now I want to put in a word for the Bioinitiative report uh, which has been uh, dumped on by uh, all kinds of authorities but it's really the only report and I say that 
as strongly as I can. That's a grassroots report that was done by scientists. The other reports were done by scientist politicians with probably a greater emphasis on the word politician. These are guys who are great at committee meetings and they're not in the laboratory. They frequently have a lot of people, other work working in the lab, but they are not the kind of guys who do the actual experiments and develop the ideas. The bioinitiative, by contrast, was put together by scientists who realized the need to get inform the public. And this is what uh, the bioinitiative report, it started that way and it has continued that way. Uh, we were criticized. I was one of the people who helped to uh, bring this thing apart, uh, uh, to, to pass. Uh, it was uh, criticized. One of the criticisms was that it wasn't published. It was published online, and it was believed to be, uh, you know, therefore it wasn't scientifically legitimate. So uh, we put it uh, into a journal, and I went through, I was the editor of that, and I put through the st good peer-reviewed kind of process, which is called, which gives it legitimacy. So we have it as a legitimate publication also. So that criticism has been uh, circumvented. But now we have a new bioinitiative report, which was just published at the end of last year. And you can read it. It's online. Everybody can get the information from it. And it's up-to-date information written by scientists, written by the scientists who actually did those experiments. And there are no punches pulled. There are a variety of points of view. We don't all agree on everything, but the fact that's the way science works, and I think that's the way uh, you should really read it. And instead of reading the uh, stuff that you read from these official committees, it probably pays to take a look at the stuff that is the real science that was made to actually uh, for greater public viewing. In other words, it's written for people like you. Now, just summarizing, the evidence of health effects is enormous. Many biological systems are affected. Many frequencies are active. The thresholds are very low. And the mechanisms are known. The mechanism with DNA is one that I've talked a bit about. I haven't talked about the blood-brain barrier, which has to do with leakage. That's one of the earliest things that was discovered back in, in 19, 1970. Alan Fry was the first to show that there was leakage of the blood-brain barrier when he was one of the early workers on uh, radar. Melatonin is another thing. Melatonin is a uh, secretion of one of the parts of the, the pineal gland in the brain. And that uh, secretion uh, helps us regulate our sleep-wake cycle. And it's very important to have that sleep because during that sleep, we get a lot of the repair done. And if you get interference with melatonin, you get interference with the repair processes, the DNA repair. So we have knowledge of mechanisms, and the mechanisms fit. We have a good understanding of that. So the other thing we have to realize is that there are cumulative effects, and that's very important. Everybody focuses on what's the issue of the day, but it's all an issue. Power lines, TV, FM, cell phones, Wi-Fi, smart meters, the whole works. They're all doing things to us because our system reacts to all of it. I might mention one interesting thing as a sideline. And, uh, FM, when it was introduced, uh, people in Scandinavia realized that there was an increase in, uh, in melanoma. Melanoma used to appear only on, p uh, on parts of the body that were exposed to the sun. It's a cancer of the skin. And so you'd get it on your face, or in the summertime you'd get it on the parts of the body that are exposed, but basically it's the exposed parts. The new melanoma is appearing all over the body. It's not that common, the disease, but when it appears, it is appearing all over the body. So it's a, it's a different kind of exposure, indicating that it's not like exposure from the sun, it's exposure from all the other electromagnetic fields. So, I'll end with the question, what can you do with all this knowledge? And I'll just read these slowly because stay away from sources of EMF for as long as you can. Power off devices when not in use. People, men in particular, like to put their cell phones in their pockets. Power them off. There have been, I haven't mentioned the infertility that shows up. Uh, sperm counts go down when, uh, for men who carry these things in their pockets. Not only sperm count, 
but sperm distortion. The sperm cell has a very well-defined geometry, a nice head and a tail that wiggles and that propels the sperm head. But uh, one of the things that happens with sperm is when it's exposed to this, you get kinks in the tail and it can't function as a sperm cell. So that's one of the things that uh, I, people ought to realize. And women, of course, carrying the cell phones in their bras. Now, the third point, maintain your own health because damage is part of life. We're gonna get exposure to the sun. The sun is a natural thing. It causes some damage. We get sunburn, we know about that, but we also get damage from the radiation that comes with it. And the way you maintain your your ability to cope with that is through nutrition, rest, and exercise. This is a very important part of how to cope with the modern environment. Now, the other thing is get involved politically if you can, and I don't mean politically like a politician, uh, but petition for proper biologically based safety limits and urge the government and industry to re reduce EMF. Now, uh, the last point I have in there is that there are also places for changes that can occur in schools. So with that, I'd like to close, and I hope that I've been able to fill you with enough ideas to convince you that we now know enough to do something actively, and we should not be deterred by people who will tell you that there's not enough information for action. Thank you.